Hello, everyone. On today's panel, the theme is drug discovery and how artificial intelligence can make a difference. On the panel today, we are honored to have Dr. Ryan Yates, principal scientist at the National Center for Natural Products Research, with a focus on botanicals, specifically their pharmacokinetics, which is essentially um, how the drug changes over time in our body, and pharmacodynamics, which is essentially what, how drugs affect our body. And of particular interest to him is the use of AI in preclinical screening models to identify chemical combinations that can target chronic inflammatory processes such as fatty liver disease, cognitive impairment, and aging. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you for coming. Good morning. Thank you for having me. The other distinguished panelist is Dr. Rangan Sukuma, our very own. He's a distinguished technologist at the CTO office for high performance computing and artificial intelligence with a PhD in AI and 70 publications that can be applied in drug discovery, autonomous vehicles, and social network analysis. Hey, Rangan, welcome. Thank you for coming, for sparing the time. We have also our distinguished Chris Davidson. He's leader of our HPC and AI application and performance engineering team. His job is to tune and benchmark applications, particularly in the applications of weather, energy, financial services, and life sciences. Yes, of particular interest is life sciences. He spent 10 years in biotech and medical diagnostics. Yeah, hi, Chris. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. Well, let's start with you, Chris. Yes. You, are, you regularly interface with uh, pharmaceutical companies and worked also on the COVID-19 White House Consortium. You know, tell us, uh, let's, let's kick this off and tell us a little bit about your engagement in the drug discovery process. Right, and that's a good question. I think really setting the framework for what we're talking about here is to understand what is the drug discovery process. Uh, and that can be kind of broken down into, I would say, four different areas. Uh, there's the research and development space, the preclinical studies space, clinical trials, uh, and regulatory review. And if you're lucky, hopefully approval. Uh, traditionally, this is a slow, arduous process. It costs a lot of money, and there's a high amount of error, right? However, this mm -hmm. process, by its very nature, is highly iterative and has just a huge amounts of data, right? It's very data-intensive. Right? And it's these char characteristics that make this uh, process a great target for kind of new approaches and, and different ways of doing things. Right? So you, for the sake of discussion, right? Go ahead. Uh, yes. So you, you mentioned data intensive. It brings to mind artificial intelligence. You know? uh, so artificial intelligence is making a difference here in this process. Is that so? Right, and, and some of those novel approaches are, are actually based on artificial intelligence, whether it's deep learning or machine learning, et cetera. Um, you know, a prime example would say, let's just say, uh, for the sake of discussion, let's say there's a brand new virus, uh, causes flu-like symptoms, shall not be named. Uh, if we focus kind of on the R&D phase, right, our goal is really to identify a target for the treatment and then screen compounds against it to see which, you know, which ones we take forward. Right. To, to this end, technologies like cryo -electron, uh, cryogenic mm -hmm. electron microscopy, uh, just a form of microscopy, uh, can provide us a near atomic biomolecular map of the samples uh, that we're studying, right? whether that's a virus, uh, a microbe, uh, the cell that it's attaching to, and so on. Right? AI, for instance, has been used in the particle picking uh, aspect of this process. Um, when you take all these images, uh, you know, there are only certain particles that we want to take uh, and, and study, right? Whether they have good resolution or not, whether it's in the field of the frame. Uh, Im image recognition is a huge part of this. Uh, it's massive amounts of data and AI can be very easily, uh, you know, used to, to approach that. Right. So, so with docking, uh, you can take the biomolecular maps that you've, that you've achieved from cryo-electron microscopy and you can take those and input that into, into the docking application and then run multiple iterations to figure out which will give you the best fit. Um, AI, again, right, this is an iterative process. It's extremely data intensive. Uh, it's, it's an easy way to just apply AI and, and get that best fit. Uh, doing something in a very 
you know, uh, analog manner that would just take humans very long time to do, or traditional mm. computing a very long time to do. Uh, Ryan, Ryan, uh, you, you work at the NCNPR, you know, very exciting. You know, after all, you know, at some point in history, just about all drugs were from natural products, you know. So it's, it's great uh, to have you here today. Please, please tell us a little bit about your work with, your, with the pharmaceutical companies, uh, especially uh, when it is often that drug cocktails or what they call polypharmacology is the answer to complete drug therapy. Please tell us a bit more with your work there. Yeah, thank you again for having me uh, here this morning, Dr. Go. It's a pleasure to be here. And as you said, I'm from the National Center for Natural Products Research. You'll hear me refer to it as the NCNPR here in Oxford, Mississippi on the Ole Miss campus. Uh, beautiful setting here in the South. And so what, as you said, historically, what the drug discovery process has been, and it's really not a drug discovery process, it's really a therapy process, traditional medicine, is we've looked at natural products from medicinal plants, okay, and these extracts. And so where I'd like to begin is really sort of talking about the assets that we have here at the NCNPR. One of those prime assets, unique assets, is our medicinal plant repository which comprises approximately 15,000 different medicinal plants. And what that allows us to do, right, is to screen, mine, that repository for activity. So whether you have a disease of interest or whether you have a target of interest, then you can use this medicinal plant repository to look for actives, in this case, active plants. It's really important in today's environment of drug discovery to really understand what are the actives in these different medicinal plants, which leads me to the, the second unique asset here at the NCNPR, and that is our, what I'll call a plant deconstruction laboratory. So without going into great detail, but what that allows us to do is uh, a, a, through a high throughput workstation, right, is to facilitate rapid isolation and identification of phytochemicals in these different medicinal plants. Right? And so things that have historically taken us weeks and sometimes months, think um, acetosalicylic acid from salicylic acid as a pain reliever in the willow bark or mm -hmm. taxol, right, as an anti-cancer drug, right? Now we can do that with this system on the matter of days or weeks. So now we're talking about activity from a plant, an extract, down to phytochemical characterization on a time scale, which starts to make sense in modern drug discovery. All right. And so now if you look at these phytochemicals, right, and you ask yourself, well, sort of who is interested in that and why, right? Well, we, our traditional pharmaceutical companies, right, which I've been working with for 20 or over 25 years now, right, typically uses these natural products or historically has used these natural products as starting points for new drugs, right? So in other words, take this phytochemical and make chemical synthetic modifications in order to achieve um, a, a potential drug. But in the context of natural products, unlike the pharmaceutical realm, there is a, a, oftentimes a big knowledge gap between a disease and a plant. In other words, I have a plant that has activity, but how to connect those dots has been really laborious, time consuming. So it took us uh, probably 50 years to go from salicylic acid and willow bark to synthesized acetosalicylic acid or aspirin. Just, it just doesn't work in today's environment. So casting about trying to figure out how we expedite that process, that's when about four years ago, I read a really fascinating article in the Los Angeles Times about my colleague and business partner, Dr. Ramin Sukumar, describing all the interesting things that he was doing in the area of artificial intelligence. And um, one of my favorite parts of this story is basically um, unannounced, I arrived at his doorstep in Oak Ridge. He was working at Oak Ridge National Labs at the time. And I introduced myself to him, didn't know I was coming, didn't know who I was, right? And I said, hey, you don't know me, you don't know why I'm here. I said, but let me tell you what I wanna do with your system, right? And so that kicked off a, a very fruitful um, um, collaboration and friendship um, over the last four years using artificial intelligence and has culminated most recently in our COVID-19 project collaborative research between the NCNPR and mm. uh, HPE in this case. From what I can understand, uh, also as Chris has mentioned, highly iterative, uh, as, uh, especially with this uh, combination mixture of, uh, of chemicals, right, uh, in plants that could uh, 
affect a disease. We need to put in effort to figure out uh, what are the active components in there that affects it, uh, the combination. And, and uh, g given the layman's way of, uh, of, of understanding it, yeah. And, and, and therefore, iterative and highly data intensive. And I, I can see why Rangan uh, can play a huge uh, significant role here. Rangan, uh, thank you for joining us. So it's just a nice segue to, to bring you in here. You know, given, given your work with Ryan uh, over so many years now, uh, tell, I think I'm also quite interested in knowing a little about how it developed. The first time you met and, and the process uh, and, uh, and the things you all worked together on that culminated into the progress at the advanced level today. Please tell us a little bit about that, that history. And, and also the current yeah. work. Ryan, yeah. so, so Ryan, like you mentioned, walked into my office about four years ago and he was like, hey, I, I'm working on this omega-3 fatty acid. What can your system tell me about this omega-3 fatty acid? And I didn't even know how to spell omega-3 fatty acid. So that's the disconnect between a technologist and the pharmacology person that talks in your office, right? Since then, you've come a long way. I think I understand his terminologies now, and he understands when I throw words like knowledge graphs and, uh, and page rank and then all kinds of weird stuff that, uh, that he's probably never heard in his life before, right? So, so it's been a, a meld of two different domains and terminologies and trying to accept each other's expertise and trying to work together on a collaborative project. And I think the core of what Ryan's work and collaboration has led me to understanding is what happens with the drug discovery process, right? So when you think about drug discovery itself, we're looking at companies that are trying to accelerate the process to market, right? An average drug is taking 12 years to get to market, the process that Chris just mentioned, right? And so companies are trying to adopt what's called the uh, in silico simulation techniques and in silico modeling techniques into what was predominantly an in vitro, in silico, in vivo environment, right? And so the in silico techniques could include things like molecular docking, could include artificial intelligence, could include other data-driven discovery methods and so forth. And the essential component of all the things that, that you know, drug discovery workflows have is the ability to augment human experts to do their best by assisting them with what computers do really, really well. So, so in, in terms of what we've done as examples is Ryan walks in and he's asked me a bunch of questions and a few just come to mind immediately. The first few are, hey, you are an artificial intelligence expert. Can you sift through a database of molecules, the 15,000 compounds that he's, he described, to prioritize a few for wet lab experiments? So that's question number one. And then he's come back onto my office and asked me about, hey, there's 30 million publications in PubMed, and I don't have the time to read everything. Can you create an artificial intelligence system that once I pick these few molecules will tell me everything about that molecule or everything about that virus, mm -hmm. the unknown virus that shows up, right? So he's trying to understand what are some ways in which he can augment his expertise, right? And then the third question, I think he described it better than I'm going to, was uh, how can technology connect these dots? And typically, it's not that the answer to a drug discovery problem sits in one database, right? He probably has to think about Uniprod on proteins. He has to think about PubChem for chemical informatics uh, properties data and so forth. Then he talked about the phytochemical interaction that's probably in another database. So when he's trying to answer a question, and, and specifically in the context of an unknown virus that showed up in, uh, in, in late last year, we, we, uh, the question was, hey, do we know what happened in this particular virus compared to all previous viruses? Do we know of any substructure that was studied for a different disease that's part of this unknown virus? And can I use that information to go mine these databases to find out if these interactions can actually be used as a repurposing hook Say this drug is known to interact with this subsequence of a known virus that also seems to be part of this new virus, right? So to be able to connect that dot, I think the abstraction that we are learning from uh, working with pharma companies is that this drug discovery process is complex, it's iterative, and it's a sequence of needle in the haystack search problems, right? And so, so one day, Brian would be like, hey, I need to match genome. I need to match protein sequences between two different viruses. Another day it would be like, you know, I need to sift through a database of potential compounds, identify side effects and whatnot. Another day it could be, hey, I need to design a new molecule that never existed in the world before. I'll figure out, figure out how to synthesize it later on, but I need to figure out, I need a completely new molecule because of patentability reasons, right? So it goes through the entire spectrum. And I think where HPE has demonstrated multiple times, even in the recent weeks, is that the technology infusion into drug discovery leads to several aha moments. And, uh, and, and, and the aha moments typically happen in the order of a few seconds and not the hours, days, months that uh, Ryan has to laboriously work through. And what we've learned is uh, pharma researchers love their aha moments and it leads to a, a sound, valid, well-founded hypothesis. 
Isn't that true, Ryan? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. At some point, I would like to, to have a look at your peek at your, the list of your aha moments, yeah? And perhaps there's something quite interesting in there for other industries too, but we'll do it at another time. Yeah. Chris, uh, you know, uh, with your regular uh, in, uh, work with uh, pharmaceutical companies, especially the big farmers, right? Um, do you see botanicals uh, coming, uh, being talked about more and more there? Uh, yeah, we do, right? Uh, looking at kind of biosimilars and, and, and drugs that are, that are already really in existence is kind of an important po uh, point. And, and uh, Dr. Yates and, and Rangan, with your work with databases, this is something uh, important to bring up. It, much of the drug discovery in today's world isn't from going out and finding a brand new molecule, per mm -hmm. se. It's, it's really looking at all the different databases right, all the different compounds that already exist and sifting through those, right? Um, of course, data is mined and, and it is gold, essentially, right? So a lot of companies don't want to share their data. Uh, a lot of those botanical uh, data sets are actually open to the public to use um, in many cases, and, and people are wanting to have more collaborative efforts around those uh, databases. So that's really interesting to kind of see that being picked up more and more. Mm. Well, and, and Ryan, that's where NCNPR hosts m much of those data sets here, yeah. right? And, and my, it's interesting to me, right? You know, you were describing the, the traditional way of drug discovery where you have a target uh, and a compound, right? Uh, that can affect that target, very, very specific. But from a botanical point of view, you really say, for example, uh, have an extract from a plant that has combination of chemicals and somehow you know it affects this disease but then you have to reverse engineer what those chemicals are and what the active ones are. Is that very much the, the issue, uh, the, the, the work that has to be put in for botanicals in this area? Yes, Dr. Rio, you, you've hit it exactly. Now I can understand why uh, highly iterative intensive and data intensive, and, and perhaps that's why Rangan, uh, you're highly valuable here, right? Uh, so tell us about the challenge, right? The many to many uh, intersection to try and find what the targets are, right, given uh, th these botanicals that seem to affect the disease here. Yeah. Um, uh, what, what methods do you use, right, in AI to help with this? Fantastic question. I'm going to go a little bit deeper and speak like Ryan in terminology, but uh, here we go. So, with, so going back to the starting of a conversation, right, so let's say we have a database of molecules on one side, and then we've got the database of potential, you know, targets in a particular could be a virus, could be a bacteria, could be whatever, a disease target that you've identified, right? Oh, uh, just, just for, so for, for example, on a virus, you can have, can have a number of uh, targets on the virus itself. Some have the spike protein, some of the other proteins on the surface. So there are about three different targets and others on a virus itself. Precisely. Yeah. So a lot of people Precisely. focus on the spike protein, right? But uh, there are other targets too on that uh, virus, correct? That's exactly right. So, so for example, so the work that we did with Ryan, we realized that, you know, COVID-19 protein sequence has an overlap, a significant overlap with the previous SARS-CoV-1 virus. Not only that, it has overlap with MERS, it has overlap with some bad coronavirus that was studied before and so forth, right? So knowing that, and it's actually broken down into multiple, and right, I'm gonna steal your words, non-structural proteins, envelope proteins, S proteins, there's a whole substructure that you can associate an amino acid sequence with, right? So on the one hand, you have different targets. And, and again, since we did the work, there's 160, different targets, even on the COVID-19 oh. virus, right? And so you're trying to match 37, 36, 37 million molecules that are potentially synthesizable and try to figure out which one of those or which few of those is actually going to be mapping to which one of these targets and actually have a mechanism of action that Brian's looking for that will inhibit the symptoms on a human body, right? So that's the, that's the challenge there. And so I think the techniques that we can unroll go back to how much do we know about the target and how much do we know about the molecule, right? And if you start off a problem with, I don't know anything about the molecule and I don't know anything about the target, you go with the traditional approaches of docking and molecular dynamic simulations and whatnot, right? But then you've done so much docking before on the same database for different targets, you have learned some new things about the, the ligands, the molecules that Ryan's talking about that could be potential targets. So can you use that information of previous protein interactions or previous binding to known existing targets with similar structures and so forth to build a model that will capture that essence of all you've learned from the docking before. Right? So that's the second level of how do we infuse artificial intelligence. The third level is to say, okay, I can do this for a database of molecules, 
But then what if the protein-protein interactions are all over the literature studied for millions of other viruses? How do I connect the dots across different mechanisms of actions too, right? And so this is where the knowledge graph component that Ryan was talking about comes in. So we've put together a database of about 150 billion medical facts from literature that Ryan is able to connect the dots and say, okay, I'm starting with this molecule. What interactions do I know about the molecule? Is there a protein-protein interaction that affects the mechanism of pathway for the symptoms that a disease is causing? And then he can go and figure out which protein and protein in the virus could potentially be working with this drug so that inhibiting certain activities would stop that progression of the disease from happening, right? So like I said, mm -hmm. your method of options, the, the options you've got is going to be how much do you know about the target, how much do you know about the, uh, the, the drug database that you have, and how much information can you leverage from previous research as you go down this, this pipeline, right? So, so in that sense, I think we mix and match different methods, and you've actually found that you know, mixing and matching different methods produces better synergies for for uh, for for people like uh, people like Ryan. So, well, well, the synergies I think is a really important concept. Wrong in additivity, synergistic, what, it, however you want to catch that, right? But it goes back to your initial question, Dr. Go, which is this this idea of polypharmacology and historically what we've done with traditional medicines. There's more than one active, more than one network that's impacted. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, you remember I, t I sort of put you on both ends of the spectrum, which is the traditional sort of approach where we really don't know much about target lag and interaction to the complete, the antipodal side of it, right? Where now we are, all we're focused on is an in uh, a single molecule interacting with a target. And so where I'm going with this is interesting enough, pharma has sort of migrate, started to migrate back toward the middle. And what I mean by that, right? is we have these, in the concept of polypharmacology, we have this idea, a regulatory pathway of so-called fixed drug combinations, okay? So now you start to see over the last 20 years, um, pharmaceutical companies taking known approved drugs and putting them in different combinations to impact different diseases, okay? And so I think there's a really unique opportunity here for artificial intelligence, or as Rangan has taught me, augmented intelligence, right, to give you insight into how to combine those approved drugs to come up with unique indications. So it's that, that patentability, right, getting back to, mm -hmm. right, how is it that it becomes commercially viable for entities like pharmaceutical companies. But I think at the end of the day, what's most interesting to me is sort of that uh, almost the, the movement back toward that complex mixture, fixed drug combination, as mm -hmm. opposed to single drug entity, single target approach. I think that opens up some really neat avenues for us. As far as the expansion, the, the applicability uh, of artificial intelligences, I'd like to talk to, to briefly about one other aspect, right? So what Rong and I have talked about is how do we take this concept of an active phytochemical and work backwards? In other words, let's say you identify a phytochemical from an in silico screening process, right? Which was done for COVID-19, one of the first publications out of a group, uh, Dr. Jeremy Smith's group at Oak Ridge National Lab, right? Identified a natural product as one of the the interesting actives, right? And so it raises the question to a botanical guy, says, okay, where in nature do we find that phytochemical? What plants do I go after to try and source botanical drugs to achieve that particular endpoint, right? And so what Rangan's system allows us to do is to say, okay, let's take this phytochemical, in this case, uh, a phytochemical flavonoid called aerodictyol and say, where else in nature is this found, right? That's a trivial question for an artificial intelligence system. But for a guy like me, left to my own devices without AI, I spend weeks combing the literature. Wow, so, so this, is, this is brilliant. This, I, I've learned something here today, right? If, if you find a chemical that actually uh, uh, you know, affects and addresses a disease, right? Um, you can actually try and go the reverse way to figure out what botanicals can give you those chemicals as opposed to trying to uh, synthesize them. Well, there's that and there's the other. I I'm going to steal Rangan's uh, thunder here, right? He, he always teaches me, Ryan, don't forget, everything we talk about has properties. Plants have properties. Chemicals have properties, et cetera. It's, it's really understanding those properties and using those properties to make those connections, those edges, those sort of interfaces, right? And so, yes, we can take something like an aerodictyol right, that example I gave before and say, okay, now, based upon the properties of aerodictyol, tell me other phytochemicals 
other flavonoids in this case, it's a phytochemical class at Iridictyos part, right? Is now tell me how, what other phytochemicals match that profile, have the same properties. Mm. It might be more economically viable, right? In other words, this particular phytochemical is found in a unique Himalayan plant that will never be able to source, but can we find something similar, the same thing, growing in, you know, a, a bush found all throughout the southeast, for example, right? Wow. So, so Chris, uh, on, on the pharmaceutical companies, right, are they looking at uh, this approach of uh, getting, uh, building drugs, yeah? developing drugs? Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Go. The, really what, what Dr. Yates is talking about, right, it, it doesn't help us if we find a plant and that plant lives on one mountain only on the north side in the Himalayas. Mm. We're never going to be able to create enough of a drug to manufacture and, and to provide to the masses, right, assuming that the, the disease is widespread or, or affects a large enough uh, portion of the population, right? So understanding, you know, not only where is that botanical or that compound, but understanding the, the chemical nature of the chemical interaction and the physics of it as well, where, which aspect affects the binding site, which aspect of, of the, the compound actually does the work, if you will, uh, and then being able to, to make that at scale. Right. Um, yeah. If you go to these pharmaceutical companies to date, uh, many of them look like breweries, to be honest with you. It's, it's mm. large stills, it's large vats, everybody's clean room, and it, they're, they're making the, the microbes do the work for them, or they have these you know, unique processes, right? So, mm. so they're not brewing beer. Can, but uh, drugs <laughs> instead. Yeah. Okay. Not but, quite. Yeah, yeah, uh, although, know, although there are pharmaceutical companies out there that have had a foray into the brewery business and vice versa. So we should we should visit one of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So so what's next? Right. So we've we've uh, you, you've described to us the process uh, and and how how you develop your relationship uh, with Dr. Yates uh, Ryan uh, over over the years. Right. Five years uh, was it? Uh, and, and culminating in today's uh, the many to many fast screening methods, yeah. What what do you think would be the next exciting things you would do other than let, letting me peek at your aha moments, right? Uh, what what would be would you say are the uh, next uh, exciting steps you're hoping to take? Thinking long term, again, this is where Ryan and I are working on this uh, long term project about. We don't know enough about botanicals as much as we know about the synthetic molecules, right? And so this is a story that's inspired from, uh, uh, from Simon Sinek's Infinite Game book, trying to figure out if human population has to survive for a long time, which we've done so far with natural products, we're gonna need natural products, right? So what can we do to help organizations like NC and PR to stage genomes of natural products, to stage and understand the evolution as we go through, understand the evolution to map to drugs and so forth. So the vision is huge, right? So it's not, it's not something that we're gonna do on a one-off project and go away, but in the process, just like you are learning today, Dr. Go, I'm gonna be learning quite a bit, having fun with Ryan. So Ryan, what do you think? Ryan, we're learning from you. <laughs> so my paternal grandfather lived to be 104 years of age. Um, I, I've got a few years to get there, but back to the infinite gain concept that, that Ron and Mitch and he and I discussed that quite frequently. I, I'd like to throw out a vision for you that's, that's well beyond that uh, sort of time horizon that, that we have as humans, right? And that's this, right? Is our current strategy, and, and it's understandable, is really treatment centric. In other words, we have a disease, we develop a treatment for that disease. But we all recognize, whether you're a healthcare practitioner, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a, a business person, right, or, or, or whatever occupation, you realize that prevention, right, the old uh, ounce prevention worth a pound of cure, right, is how can we use something like artificial intelligence to develop preventive sorts of strategies that we are able to predict with time, right? That's why we don't have preventive treatment approach, right? We can't do a traditional clinical trial and say, did we prevent type two diabetes in an 18 year old? Well, we can't do that on a time scale that is reasonable, okay? And then the other part of that is why focus on botanicals is because for the most part, and there are exceptions, I wanna be very clear. I don't wanna paint the picture that botanicals are all safe. You should just take botanicals, dietary supplements and you'll be safe, right? There are exceptions, but for the most part, 
botanicals, natural products are in fact safe and have undergone testing, human testing for thousands of years, right? So how do we connect those dots? A preventive strategy with existing extant botanicals to really develop a healthcare system that becomes preventive centric as opposed to treatment centric. If I could wave a magic wand, that's the vision that I would uh, figure out how we could achieve, right? And I do think with guys like Ranga and, and Chris and folks like yourself, England, that, that that's possible. Um, maybe it's in my lifetime. I, I got 50 years to go to get to my grandfather's age, but you never know, right? <laughs> You bring up really two really good points there, uh, Ryan. It's the, really a systems approach, right? Understanding that things aren't just linear, right? And, and as you go through, it, there's no impact to anything else, right? Taking that systems approach to understand every aspect of, of how things are being impacted. Uh, and then number two is really kind of the downstream. Really, we've been discussing the drug discovery process a lot and kind of the, the kind of preclinical in vitro studies and in vivo uh, models. But once you get to the clinical trials, there are many drugs that just fail, just fail miserably. And the botanicals, right, uh, known to be safe, right, in many instances, you can have a much higher success rate. And that would be really interesting to see, you know, more mm -hmm. of at least growing in the, in the market. Yeah. Well, these uh, are very visionary uh, statements from each of you, especially uh, Dr. Yates. Uh, right? Uh, prevention better than cure, right? Being proactive uh, better than being reactive. Uh, reactive is important, but uh, we also need to focus on being proactive. Yes. Well, thank you very much, right? Uh, this has been a brilliant panel uh, with brilliant panelists, uh, Dr. Ryan Yates, Dr. Rangan Sukuma, and Chris Davison. Thank you very much for joining us on this panel and highly illuminating conversation. Yeah, offer the future of drug discovery that includes botanicals. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.